So we're going to keep talking about fluids. And last time I also oh, we talked about things like pressure. which was a force supplied over some area. And then we introduced this idea of Pascal's principle, which said that the pressure in one part of a closed system has to be the same as the pressure in another part. So. Or in other words, the pressure has to be the same everywhere in your system. And so the mathematical representation of that is if you had two different spaces that were connected, then the pressure in this space over here has to be the same as the pressure in this space over here. And then because the pressures are the same, if we just replace our equation for pressure in this equation, then that means that force one over area one has to equal force two over area two. So we introduced this last time, but now let's uh, work an example of this kind of problem. So if we have these two cylinders that are gonna be connected to each other. And let's say that R2 is two meters and R1 is one meter. If I apply some force F1 over here, let's say 10 Newtons, we can figure out the force that will be applied to this other circular for F2. And so if this is our equation, uh, so from Pascal's principle, you have P1 equals P2. So F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. So just using the picture that I've drawn and the, this ratio, uh, what do we think about F2? Is F2 going to be bigger or smaller than F1? So if the, okay, well, 
we, we will figure that out now. So F2 is going to be bigger than F1. So if we calculate area one, so if this is a circle and it has this radius, then the area would be pi r squared. The radius is one. So this would be 3.14 meters per second, or not meters per second, meters squared. Now, if we calculate area two, pi r squared, the radius for the r2 is two meters. And so this would be four times 3.14, which would be 12 point five six meters squared. <clears throat> so now we've got our areas. We're given a, so we have F1, area one and area two. And what we're solving for is force two. So if we rearrange this equation, we get force two equals F1, area two over area one. And plugging in our numbers, that's 10 times 12.56 over 3.14, so that would be 19 something. Or 40, 40 new. And so this is a pretty important result for some technology that we use. You can apply a small force to some small part of a system and get a bigger force out of a bigger part of a system uh, just by having some fluid in the system that all has to be at the same pressure. So this is how hydraulic systems work and the brakes in your car. You only have to apply a little bit of force to your brake pedal and that's enough to uh, stop your car's wheels from spinning. And that's because the small force you apply with your foot gets transferred into this bigger force that's applied to the, the wheels of your car. So with these kind of problems, you'll be given three, uh, three of these parameters, and then you can find the fourth parameter. Or conceptually, you would be uh, like in this problem, <clears throat> you don't necessarily need to know what F1 is to know that F2 is going to be bigger than F1, just because you know that the area two is bigger than area one. So any questions about Pascal's principle or how you would use this equation? Okay. So now we're going to move on to something else uh, related with fluids. So this was kind of how a fluid in a system would work. And now we're gonna look at how solid objects interact with fluids. So we're gonna talk about floating 
and that's governed by Archimedes principle. So being on an island, we should be familiar with this kind of floating. This is how boats work. This is how people float when they're swimming. And so a picture of what's happening. So if something is sitting in the water, it's on the earth. So what force is it gonna feel? Gravity pulling it down. And if something floats, we know that it doesn't sink, it doesn't keep going down. So there has to be some force that pushes up that counteracts that force of gravity. And that's the buoyant force. And so just to draw a parallel, this is similar to the normal force, right? So if you have a box sitting on a flat surface, then gravity is pulling down. And because the box doesn't somehow fall through the solid surface, there has to be some force counteracting gravity and that's the normal force. So the buoyant force is the analog to the normal force, but for things that are in fluids. And because, so this would be a solid surface, and this is obviously a fluid. So because fluids are different from solids, the way that this works is gonna be a little bit different. And you can kind of already see, based on how I drew this picture, that this object is not sitting on top of the water, it's kind of, in the water a little bit. So the fact that this is partially submerged is important. So we'll look at that now. So any questions about this? So let me draw that picture again. Yep, have it bigger. And so we'll, you'll see uh, how this works in the lab next week. But what Archimedes principle tells us is that the, the volume of the yes, more generally, if you place something in a fluid, the object will displace some of the fluid. And the volume of the submerged part of the object is the same as the 
the volume of the fluid, but it displaces. So I'll do it in red. So the part in red is the part of the object that's submerged. So submerged just means under the water. And so the volume submerged volume of the submerged part of the object has to equal the volume of the fluid that is displaced. And so this is just kind of a law of how objects in general work. And as you get down to thinking about particles and quantum mechanics, this is still how uh, this works. You can't have two things in the same place at the same time, basically. So because I've now put this box in the water, the water that was there has to get pushed away to make room for the box. And now we'll use the fact that the volume of the water that's displaced has to be the same as the volume of the object, uh, the submerged part of the object that you put in it uh, to figure out what, uh, so what, fraction of the object is submerged. So any questions about this before I move on? So we're going to start with this volume submerged equals volume of the fluid. Now, because this is an equation, I can just divide both sides of the equation by the same thing. So I'm going to divide both sides by the volume of the, the total volume of the object. Okay, so this is submerged volume. This is the total volume of the object. This is the volume of displaced fluid. So now if we remember uh, something that we learned last time was that density equals mass divided by volume.
And so density was just some property of the object and of the fluid. And so we can replace volume with mass divided by density. So if we do that on the right-hand side of the equation, then we would get mass of the fluid divided by the density of the fluid over mass of the object divided by the density of the object. And now I define this ratio, so this ratio is defined as the fraction submerged which is what we wanted to find. And now from Archimedes principle, we know that the mass and so the mass of the fluid that's displaced is equal to the mass of the object. And so we would end up with one over density of the fluid divided by one over the density of the object, which we can rewrite as density of the object divided by density of the fluid. And that equals the fraction submerged. If I, so if this is our water, uh, I'm gonna go back to the last screen for a second. Uh, so if I want my object to be floating, then I guess I can draw a couple different pictures. So in order for my object to float, what does my fraction submerged have to be less than? has to be less than some percentage in order to float, right? So what would that percentage be? One, right? So I need my fraction submerged to be less than one in order to be floating. So this is your condition. or floating. So 
So another way to write this would be that your density of your object divided by the density of the fluid has to be less than one. So these are your, your conditions for fluid. Or another way to think about it is that the density of the object has to be less than the density of the fluid. So it doesn't matter how much mass the thing has or how much it weighs, it just matters how dense it is. So you can build something really big like a ship and it will still float as long as the total density of the object is less than the density of water. So remember that density is mass over volume. So if you want to increase your mass a lot, like with a big container ship or a cruise liner or something, then you also need to increase your volume so that the density would be less than the density of water. And so that's how something really big, like a ship can still float. So maybe we can work an example. Yeah. Well, if you, you don't have to increase them both. It's just, if you're increasing mass because you want more people on your cruise ship and you want more, like you want a casino in your cruise ship that's really heavy then you can include that, but you need to make the volume of the total thing that's floating to be big to compensate for that. Because if you make the volume bigger, then since volume is in the denominator, that would make the density decrease. So let's look up the mass of a cruise ship. Okay, we'll have to do some conversion. Okay, so let's look at cruise ship. So I'm seeing that a cruise ship has a weight of 200,000 gross tons. So I'm not entirely sure what that is, but we can convert that to kilograms. Be... All right, this is two and then feet. Two times ten to the eighth 
kilograms. Okay, so if this is the mass of the thing that we want to float, and we want the density to be less than the density of water, the density of water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed. And so the density of our ship is mass of the ship. Divided by the volume of the ship. And that has to be less than the density of water. So since we're given the mass, we want to solve for the volume. So we would multiply the volume of the ship to the other side and then divide by divide the mass of the ship by the density of water. So the mass of the ship is two times 10 to the eight kilograms. The density of water is 10 to the three kilogram per meter cubed. And so the volume of the ship would have to be greater than two times 10 to the five meters. So as long as you're fitting all of this mass inside of this volume or something a little bit bigger than this volume, then your object should float. Now, obviously, uh, the closer you get to this two times 10 to the fifth, the lower in the water you're gonna be. Uh, so you probably want your volume to be even bigger if you wanted it to sit higher up in the water, which is how cruise ships usually work. So that's another problem that you could do. So we just found the volume if we wanted it to just barely be able to float, but you could come back to this uh, fraction submerged. And instead of it being one, uh, maybe you want it to be like this picture where it sits really high up in the water. And then maybe you'd only want the fraction submerged to be like 30%. So then you would come here and instead of this one, you would replace it with 0.3. And then you could do that same calculation again, only now instead of using one, you would use 0.3. Yes. Yeah, so if you make the volume of the ship bigger, because the volume's in the denominator, you make the density of the ship go down and things that are less dense have an easier time floating in whatever fluid. Yes. Um, this one. Uh, 
so here it says two times 10 to the eighth kilograms divided by 10 to the three kilogram per meter cube. Is that what you were asking? So this is an example of things floating, uh, but can you think of another example, say from nature where things like a solid object is interacting with the water, but it's not necessarily floating, but it's also not sinking? Lily pads, uh, I'm not sure if lily pads are, I think those are floating. What were you saying? Icebergs. Icebergs also float. There's a lot under the water. So uh, the example that I'm thinking of is, uh, so if we think about, uh, so very small things like, Uh, so if you think about like small insects or something, but they just kind of are on top of the water. They're not at all submerged. So what's going on with that? Yep. So that's what, that's what this is going to be about. So when small things sit on top of the surface of the water, uh, the way that that works is through surface tension. And so the equation for this is this gamma times force over length. So this term is the surface tension, this is a force, and this is a length. And the way that this works, now let's see if I can draw a good picture. So if this is your bug, very well drawn. And this is the surface of the water. Then your bug still has gravity acting on it. So there needs to be some force that is counteracting it. So instead of the buoyant force, which point, pointed straight up, uh, and you can kind of get a picture of this from the way that the, the water is deformed, uh, but there's gonna be, maybe I'll draw it from, I'll get rid of the legs of the insect. So if you look at the, the water here, it's gonna be pushing in this direction on the insect. And then if you look at the water here, it's gonna be pushing that way. And so the way that I draw my Free body diagrams as I start from the center and draw it out like that. So maybe I'll color code those. So the red arrow is pointing there. And so when I draw my free body diagrams, I would have it pointed like that. And then in yellow, this part of the water is pushing up and to the left. And so I draw my free body diagram. Like that. So this is FST for surface tension.
And so this is a property. Uh, so the surface tension. So this is a property of the fluid. So just like density was the uh, some property of the fluid that just had to do with what type of fluid it was, the surface tension is also just going to be some property of that fluid. So the density of water is 1,000 uh, kilogram per meter cubed. And it doesn't matter how much water I have or where I got that water from, that's the density of water. So the same thing with surface tension. So the surface tension of water is 72 millinewtons per meter. So instead of millinewtons, which we have not used in this class, we'll just say that it's times 10 to the minus three newtons per meter. So if we look up the mass of some bug, so let's see. I'll, I'll do that on the next slide. Uh, but does anyone else need anything else on this slide before I move on? Yes. ST. Right, so just that surface tension is just a property of that type of fluid. So this surface tension of water is going to be the same for any type of water that I grab and any amount of water. So the same thing with density. So it doesn't matter how much water I have, the density of it is still the same. So let's calculate an example of this. So if we had an ant on top of the water, we know the surface tension of the water we said was 72 times 10 to the minus three newtons per meter. And if we look at the the force of gravity that an ant would feel. So an ant has a mass of four times 10 to the minus three grams, which would be four times 10 to the minus six kilograms times 9.8. So that would give me a weight or a gravitational force for the ant of We'll just do an approximation. So four times 10 to the minus five Newtons. And so given this equation, as long as the, so if we wanted to, so if we're, we found the force and we're given the surface tension of water, then we could solve this for the length of the ant. So surface tension divided by force.
and you would actually get a very big number. And so all this is telling you is that as long as something has this small of a mass, uh, four times 10 to the minus six kilograms, then if it has this small of a mass, it can be this long and surface tension would still keep it out of the water. So most things are not, most things that have this small of a mass would not be that big. And so uh, conceptually, what you have to remember is that the, the force of tension is only gonna be so big that it, counteracts the force of gravity. So just like the normal force can only be as big as the gravitational force, your surface tension force will only be as big as, your, as it needs to be to balance your gravitational force. Eventually, if you start making your thing too massive, then uh, the force divided by the length will be bigger than the surface tension of water, and then it won't be able to sit on top of the water anymore. So any questions about this? Yes. F T. So this is S T for surface tension. Yeah, I wrote T, but then I, I tried to sneak an S in there. So I guess another way to think about this is this is the max, max surface tension. And then as long as you are below that force divided by length, then you would sit up on top of the water. Uh, and then any force in length that's bigger than that surface tension of the water, then you would start to you could still float in the water, but part of you would be submerged. And that goes back to the Archimedes principle. And then if you're really dense, then you don't even float and you just sink. 